myself in times of trouble Mother Mary comes to me Speaking words of wisdom Let it be So let's begin with a beat, shall we? Okay, what instrument was that? Someone said it. Timpani, a kettle drum, right? Kettle drum. And so let's just hear it again so you can hear. This is the way a piece by Beethoven begins. Can anyone actually name that tune? <laughs> yeah, here it is again. He's just counting the beat. He's just counting the beat. And so there's another piece that begins with just counting the beat. And it sort of goes like this. One, two, three, five! That was one of you ladies, wasn't it? <laughs> 1963? Do the math. OK? So they both begin with a beat. I mean, a beetle, that's the joke. In, in England, a beetle is a cockroach, actually. So they just change the spelling of the name to make it beetles with an A. But at least Beethoven Pres preserves the right spelling because his name begins with a B too, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> it took you a few seconds there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Let's just hear a little bit more of the opening of that. Maybe you might recognize the first piece. Got a, it's so interesting. The sound levels on recordings are so different for classical and rock and roll. If I kept it at the same sound level, for the Beatles song, you would have all died of overexposure. Okay, here we go. There's the beat. Listen again. And that beat saturates the whole piece. And it moves to the violin. And it's obsessive. It's the whole thing. It goes on for 27 minutes. Does anyone recognize this piece? This is the violin concerto. And Beethoven loves it so. Oh, listen. There it is. It's all the beat. Let's do it quadruple time. Same thing. Right? So, but we never get tired of it, do we? I mean, I get exhausted. <laughs> But that's different from getting tired. So this idea of rhythm, of rhythm, of the beat itself being the foundation of everything. So that almost the melody is just like an afterthought. <laughs> it takes the violin four minutes to enter this piece. It's supposed to be a violin concerto. <laughs> that's longer than most rock and roll songs. <laughs> you see, the, the scope is so different. Just because Beethoven writes longer pieces doesn't mean he's a better composer. That's blasphemy. But the Beatles are just as good as Beethoven on their own ground. Because they're making experiments and exploding things. And we'll get to that in Hey Jude in just a few minutes. But let's just hear the beginning of this. This is the start of the Beatles' career. This is the very start of their career. The first song on their first album. And it starts with a count. Just the beat. One, two, three, five! Right. Well, she was just 17. Not too loud. Did you know what I mean? And, and the way she looked. Sing! It's been a long day! Sing! So how could I dance with another? Oh. See you. 
I wish we had time to listen to all. We gotta move on with it. I gotta, you know, I gotta get to Beethoven's ninth at some point. Okay, so let's start with Hey Jude. I want to tell you that all I'm doing with you right now is I'm just being grateful. This song is so good <laughs> that all we really need to do is pay attention to it. That's what you do to anything or anyone you love, isn't it? You just pay attention. But it's so funny, my Vanderbilt student, I was so happy to hear that Cornelius Vanderbilt was the most important person in the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yay. Go Vandy. So, my, my students are such snobs. I'm going to say, come on, Dr. Rose, this is just a pop song. So, you know, it's not just a pop song. Here's the start of Hey Jude. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song. So many of you know the story already. I mean, this is Cleveland, right? <laughs> you know? It's just the mothership. <laughs> On the way from the Westin Hotel to CSU, I passed by the WJW building, right? Alan Freed and Leo Mintz, a couple of linesmen, <laughs> right? These Jews, even WJW is like a misspelling of Jew. <laughs> Isn't it? So these Jews are like inventing rock and roll. It's so funny. Brian Epstein, right? <laughs> inventing the Beatles. It's Jews. Because they're Jews. <laughs> Richard Rogers song, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, here we are in Cleveland, and we're talking about rock and roll, which means we take it very seriously. And it is a serious song. Oh, Stephen, could I have a water, please? Thank you. I'm already exhausted. <laughs> it's like, you can never get too old for this, but sometimes I feel that way. It's great. This is the senior's hour, isn't it, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. It's the senior hour. I'm so sorry. It's your fourth class, right? OK. Um, this is about Julian Lennon. This is the little boy who's absolutely devastated that his parents are splitting up. And John Lennon and Cynthia Lennon, they're getting a divorce, and they just told him. And so Paul, like a good friend, one day picked up Julian from school after school, went across London, picked up Julian, and there's Julian in the car with Paul McCartney just weeping. And so Paul is like saying, oh, it's okay, it's okay, Julian, Jules, Jules, it'll be okay, Jules, Jules, don't make it bad, Jules, 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 hey, Jules. <laughs> so this particular instance, this moment, when Paul McCartney is reaching out, holding out his helping hand to this little boy who is suffering, that becomes the occasion for this song, which is about a universe of suffering. It becomes a love song, Thank you so much. Jude is the name Jude itself, oh my gosh. We're just talking about Pope Francis. He's coming to my hometown. I'm a Philly boy. And my mom is so excited. She's going to try to sneak downtown and see the Pope. Um, but you know, Jude, Jude is a Catholic saint. That's why I thought of the Pope. <laughs> so anyone know that Jude is a saint of... Lost Causes! Isn't that great? So this name is per perfect. If you are suffering, if you, if you have woe, grief in your heart, it feels like a lost cause. And that's what Hey Jude is about. It's trying to bring someone who is lost back and make them found. And then there's like this literary reference. I don't know if Paul McCartney ever read Thomas Hardy, right? 
Jude the Obscure is the most depressing novel of all time. <laughs> Has anyone actually read it? It's like so unbelievably depressing that it sold something like 150 copies <laughs> when it was published. And the publisher said, I will never publish anything by you again. And for the next 40 years, Hardy wrote poetry instead. <laughs> that was his last novel because it's so depressing. So Jude has all of these associations with suffering, woe, lost causes. And you think, was Paul really thinking about this? I don't care! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Think about it. An artist does something, it doesn't matter whether he or she intends it. The imagination surpasses logic or knowledge the intuition is boundless. This is what we call art. <laughs> so there's no explanation for it. You may not know what you're doing, but something inside of you knows exactly what it's doing, which is always true in art and love, isn't it? And it, of course in both, mistakes are made. <laughs> but that's part of the process too. The mistakes are made in this song too. This song is an odyssey, not only for Paul reaching out his hand for, to Julian and to help the little boy, or Jude becomes someone who is so caught up with their own grief and woe that they can't even look around and see where they are anymore. They're just lost. And so how does Paul construct a song to show us what it means for a lost soul to find their way back and join the living again? Well, let's listen to the beginning. And we're going to pay attention to every note, remember? You're going to get your nerd badges at the end of this, OK? You'll all be deputized as nerds. Here we go. Listen to the melody. Hey, Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song. about that melody. Let's count the number of beats in each phrase. Hey Jude, one, two, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> okay? It's one, sorry, two, four, that's not any kind of like arithmetic progression, but it is an adding of notes each time. The song comes into being, it grows, it burgeons, it finds its voice, it turns into a melody in little bits. It finds itself. You see what I mean? That the actual structure of the melody becomes a template for what Paul is asking Jude to do, what Paul is inviting Jude to, to try to grow, to allow his soul to become bigger with each phrase, like the melody itself. And the same thing happens with the song with the actual instruments. You remember, how, what are the instruments playing at the beginning? Who's, wait, it's Paul singing, what else is there? It's just a piano, right? It's just a piano. Let's keep going and see what gets added. By the way, the whole last phrase is like 23 notes. Next. Hey Jude. What's added? Don't be tambourine afraid. and guitar. You were made to You see how the song is growing? Building from nothing. The minute you let her Chorus, your skin, right? you Who's missing? To make it better. Ringo's always a little bit behind, okay? <laughs> right? It takes him a little while to catch on. But in this case, it's structurally sound. It's, it makes sense for us to wait for the bridge and then the drums mark it. You see what I mean? Because when the drums enter, it's like, oh, yeah. That's where we are now. Everyone's there. Now everyone seems to be there. We've got, who's there now? We've got the, the voice, the piano, the guitar. We've got the drums. Not finished yet, we're gonna have some more. 
it's like, it's, this is the first connection to the Ninth Symphony. <laughs> Beethoven wants the ode to joy to be all a mention. <laughs> right? You know what that means? Everybody. Okay? And mention, you know, mensch is such a good Yiddish word too. It's, it's, mensch means a human, it's a decent person, a good person, not just a human being, but someone who does the right thing. You're a mensch. What a mensch. I'll mention, that's what Paul is asking Jude to consider. Stop moping around and being a jerk. What a schmuck. You're just like, you can't even do anything. You're stuck. Come on. So this, this moment here, structurally, is so interesting when the drums start. Let me take it back a few seconds. It actually changes key. When the drums come in, it moves to a different key. Better. The bass guitar comes in right there. Don't carry the world up on your shoulder. I'm so sorry to stop and start. It's so annoying. But I've, we've got to do every note, and you can go listen to it as long as you want afterwards, okay? <laughs> We're going to pay attention now. So it's so interesting that the music, the harmony, leaves its home on the word pain. Pain becomes a moment of instability of uncertainty. I'll tell you technically, it starts in F major and it moves to B flat major. And it gets lost in B flat major. It gets lost and it has to find its way back home. And this is the bridge, the bridge of the song, the uncertain transition between verses. It's so beautiful that Paul has structured his harmony to paint the words having to do with pain, of getting away from pain, of resolving pain and coming home home to where the heart ought to be, which is with your fellow human beings. Go and get her! Yeah, it's a love song. It's a romantic song. But it's not just a girlfriend. Her becomes everyone, all of us. Go and just be a person. Open your heart. So here's the rest of the bridge. And you'll, you'll see that moment when the music lurches back into the home key. <laughs> A fool who plays it cool by making his world a little colder. Listen to them. Here it comes. Na, 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 na. Da, da, da. Right there, we're back home. Next verse. Hey, Jude, don't let me down. You have found her. Did you hear that? I'm sorry. Did you hear that? There's another Paul. Who's that other Paul? You're the other Paul? The other Paul's going, no lady out. What the hell's going on? That's the wrong lyric. That's the lyric of the next bridge. Isn't that cool? The, the lyric of the next bridge starts tumbling on top of the music of the verse. Too early. It's wrong. Think about it. why would Paul do that? He would actually, why would he purposefully discompose the structure of the song and launch the next bridge prematurely? It has to do, in my estimation, with Paul's intuitive sense that words themselves just aren't gonna cut it. Words are basically nonsense. What do we need? Not nonsense, we need na 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 sense. <laughs> okay? We've already heard one of those na na nas at the end of the first bridge. And they're going to take over the universe in the coda of this song, aren't they? The song itself is only three minutes long. The na 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 is four minutes long. <laughs> okay, it's not as long as the Ninth Symphony, but it was the longest rock and roll song up to that time. And DJs actually had trouble playing it because they needed to take their commercial breaks. But it was such a good song that they had to. So did you make sure you hear that, let it out and let it in. I'm going to pull, pick it back, put it back a few seconds so you can hear it again. You have found her. Now go Other and get her. Remember hey. to let her into your heart. Did you ever notice that before? 
for? Ah, you see? Here comes the key change. Bye-bye, yeah. out. That's the right place for those lyrics, right? The guitar is too early. You know too early. That is just you. That's the link back to the bridge. You, you do. The movement you need is on your shoulder. What? What? <laughs> what the hell does that mean? The movement you need is on your shoulder. What? <laughs> okay. Pretty cool, actually. Paul was very concerned about that line. We know this. We have, we have notes. We have documents for every second of every recording session. It's like the Talmud. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's like, you know, commentary. And there's like all of this, you know, scholarly disquisition on Beatles recording sessions. But at this moment, we've got Paul asking John, the movement, the movement you need is on your shoulder. What do you think, mate? And, and John said, like, don't change it. It's perfect. <laughs> John just loved it because it's almost nonsense, right? Does anyone have an interpretation of it? Come on, movement you need is on your shoulder. What would, you, what would that mean? Anybody? Raise your hand. Go ahead, please. What's that? Carry it on your shoulder? A, a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Matey! So the parrot is actually like whispering in its, his ear or something, telling him what to do? Or possibly an angel, right? Could be. Please go ahead. Um, he's saying that you guys do carry the role on your shoulders putting down. Oh, like Atlas. Atlas shrugged, right? <laughs> the only book I ever threw out of a window. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It's still there in the garden in London where I did it. It's still there. OK. So yeah, the movement is on your shoulder. Any other ideas? I love that. Get it off your shoulder, man. You're carrying too much. So it does make sense, but not really. Um, OK, let's go on. Let's go on. We're going to get to the uh, last verse here. <laughs> It's getting loose and loose. And John joins him now. Take a and George song joins them. And, make it better. and they have never sounded better. Remember to let her run to your skin. Then you begin to make it better. Did you hear someone's going, bleh, 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 bleh. Did you hear that? There's like little muttering underneath. And actually, we know, again, from the Talmud, that at that moment, Paul made a mistake, and he actually cursed. He said the S word. But they actually were able to like, edit it, so you couldn't hear him say that actual curse word. But you, they kept the muttering in, because he played a wrong chord at that point. So why would they keep that little muttering in? I don't know. It feels like this. It's, like, it's almost like, hold on, boys, and buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> it's like that. It's like those, you know, there's like, it's in the, in the Psalms, okay, cool. today is Shabbat Shuva, okay? <laughs> it's the holiest Sabbath of the entire year, and I'm violating it. <laughs> With you. <laughs> Aren't you honored? <laughs> this is our sacred space. <laughs> it's the day when we have to repent for our sins. I got one more, <laughs> don't I, today? But it's like it's the day of, of return and repentance. That is, we all make mistakes. That's what the Hey Jude is about. This boy has made such a terrible mistake in his life by closing himself off to his own feelings. And so there's this word in the Psalms. Some of you might know of the Hebrew. It's the word selah. Amen, selah. It's actually transliterated S-E-L-A-H. And nobody knows what it means. <laughs> So whenever they translate it, they just put cella, because they have no idea. But there's a few scholars who think that the word cella was actually a technical instruction 
to the orchestra in the temple at Jerusalem to pick up their instruments because they were going to start playing. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Because the, the choir is singing, the choir is singing, and the instruments are, are you know, they're backing off, but they have to pick them up, and Stella is their cue. And this is, like, really powerful for me, because I know that I'm a Levite. My Hebrew name is Mordechai Eliyahu ben Yisrael Chaim Halevi, and you don't mess with that. <laughs> okay? If you're a Le if Levi, that means you know that you're the ancestor of the Levites and Moses himself. And what did the Levites do in the days of the temple? Guess what? They played in the orchestra. That's where I get whatever talent I might have. I'm a Levite. So I was the one who was playing when they yelled the word Selah. Or they whispered it, actually. Selah. And that's what this muttering is. Okay? Sorry for the digression. But that's what it is. That's what it is. It's not a digression at all. Let's hear that muttering again. Take a sad song and make it better. Listen, it sounds so good. Remember to let her run so to your sweet, skin. Don't they? Oh. You begin There's the money. To make it come on, come on, boys. Better, 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 Everybody. Better. Yeah! I love the bass line too. I'll see the bass line. You keep going. Okay, it's Paul. <laughs> but what's happened to his voice? Who does it sound like? We have to play it again. You know, I'm sorry, I interrupted your singing. But as, long, <laughs> but as long as you're being quiet now, listen to this altar Paul. <laughs> the brass choir is so British. <laughs> Okay, so it's like, what happens to him? What's he doing? Actually, when they, when they were doing the takes of this in the studio, he actually ruined his voice. He lost his voice for seven weeks. He tore his larynx, doing all that for this part of it. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? It's because he's trying to sound like whom? He's trying to sound like a black man, isn't he? Little Richard, absolutely. Absolutely. Or James Brown, a little bit, but mostly Little Richard. So he literally, literally changes the color of his voice. <laughs> okay? And why? Why would he need a black man's voice at this point? Because, let's face it, and we know this because we're in Cleveland, and, any, and Nashville and Philadelphia and anywhere else, our brothers and sisters who are African American know a little bit about suffering, don't they? And that's what rock and roll is about. And the Beatles knew that. And they always paid their dues, always paid their dues to the black musicians that went before them. Always showed their gratitude. And this is one way of doing it at the very end of their career as a group in 1968. So think about this song in a broader sense, in a psychological sense. I brought my book. <laughs> so. And I would be glad if you want to, you know, if you want to get it on Amazon, you spike myself. If, if even one of you buys my book on Amazon, 
I go up from a ranking of like about three million at just something like 400,000. It's so exciting. <laughs> I go up like two and a half million points if I sell one book. So please, okay? Audible signs. It's fun making up different versions of that title. I like oddball Zionists, but, okay? Okay, not part of the 10 most important people in the world, okay? But audible signs means that actually music gives us signs. They give us clues about what's going on, like the sound of a black man's voice. These are audible signs that we just have to read them. They're symbols, crashing symbols. <laughs> And, and it has to do with the unusual, extraordinary nature of Hey Jude itself. And I have to read you from my book, because I said it better here than I can tell it to you now. Rock and roll, like all songs, it's the beginning of the world, mostly sings in the color blue. She left me. He's no good to me. She's got a ticket to ride. Oh, they're writing songs of love, but not for me. Consider just how rare it is for a pop song to hold out a helping hand to another human being instead of kvetching about one. <laughs> Here's a game I play. I, I just wanted to read you that. We could talk now. It's a game I play. Name another rock and roll song which actually is about the song reaching out a helping hand to somebody else. Come on, you can do it. Anybody? Which one? Is that the name of a pop song? We are the world. Yes. That was good. Sponsored by Coca-Cola, too. <laughs> right. Right. Another one? We are family is a good one. That's more of an affirmation. More of an affirmation. How about... I get by with a lot of my friends. It's mostly about drugs, okay? <laughs> okay. Yes. Say it. Say it. That's good. Yeah, it has the hand right in it. How about bridge over troubled water? People need people, that's really good. When you're down and troubled and you need, uh, right? Okay, you got, that's Carol King, right? Yes, she's Jewish, I'm very proud <laughs> of that. It's not the theme of the day, I promise. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. How about other Beatles songs? Very few. Another song that's about helping someone else. No. <laughs> exactly the opposite. Help me! I'm the one who's important. It's totally solipsistic. No, yesterday is like kvetching. She loved me and now she doesn't anymore. How about Dear Prudence? Dear Prudence. Come out and play, right? There's, it's like Hey Jude. It's the female side of Hey Jude. Suffering. It was actually Mia Farrow's sister, if you can believe it. She was suffering. Uh, they were in their ashram in India, and she was having an attack of depression. And John wrote this song. You know what my favorite one is? She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a friend telling his friend that this girl loves him. And... You, he better go get her, just like Jude, right? It's a fabulous song. And it makes it even more poignant if you consider, it's so clear to me, even though it's implicit, the guy who's singing the song, John, I think he loves her too, right? And he's letting go of her so that his friend can get her and have her and love her. Those are the only three Beatles songs I know that are reaching out a helping hand. That's another reason that makes this song so unusual. We have to get to Beethoven now, but let's just listen to a little bit more of this amazing coda. And it just keeps going for the next two minutes, right? Okay, I just want to show you, I've got this little Shakespeare sonnet too. Shakespeare actually, uh, he's got something to say about this. Listen to the first lines of sonnet number eight. He's talking to a young man who will not 
seek love, who has cloistered himself away from a loving relation. Music to hear. Why hearest thou music sadly? Just that first line. Why hearest thou music sadly? It's a lot like, it's like a Shakespearean translation of take a sad song and make it better. Sweets with sweets war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly? It goes on. He's actually asking his friend, the young man, to stop moping around and get the girl and get some children too. <laughs> it was actually commissioned by an aristocratic patron whose son refused to get married. <laughs> and the first few sonnets was that commission from that patron. So if you look at sonnet number eight, it's a Shakespearean translation of the lyrics to Hey Jude, okay? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it, it's more elevated language, but it's not better language. It's just different language, okay? Um, okay, I gotta put up the volume now. Let's just hear the beginning of the finale of the ninth. We've been sitting in the concert hall for 45 minutes. 45 minutes. And this is what the orchestra has to say at the beginning of the last movement. yet. What are those instruments? Cellos and double basses, right? I just have to play the beginning of that fourth movement again. Listen to the chord. I'm sorry it's not loud enough. I think this chord is terrifying. I mean, it just comes out of... Actually, I got enough hair to do it, don't I? It's like, it's like someone is really upset about something. <laughs> this is a sad song. And the next five minutes of music is Beethoven trying to make it better. Now, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to add lyrics to those cellos and basses, OK? My warrant for doing so, the license that I have for doing so, although it's rather unorthodox, is that, in fact, Beethoven is, is building that pattern of cellos and basses on what we call the recitatives of opera. It's like people talking in an opera, OK? And so I'm going to add lyrics now to it. Don't try this at home. <laughs> this is very, very dangerous. I'm going to put this on so you can hear me. OK. The director of One Day University is talking in the hallway. <laughs> Steven, be quiet. <laughs> It's on video now. <laughs> OK, are you ready? Here we go. Got a lot of very crucial. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm gonna do it without them. I'm gonna, but I'm just gonna have to shout really loud. Make sure you can hear me up there. Now I can shout. My friends, please stop all that noise. We've got a lot of very crucial work to do, and I need your attention. What's that? You won't shut up? Well then, at least won't you sing something useful? An inventory, an inventory, an inventory. And what do we hear? We hear the music of the first movement of the Ninth Symphony. Remember? A little fragment of the first movement. He's doing an inventory of the earlier parts of the symphony. 
that's enough. We've already been through that at least a hundred times before. So let's go on to the next. As I recall, it's something strange, something stirring. Second one. Second one. Bravo. That's really marvelous. But, yo, oh, no, it can't be. No, no, it can't be. All there was to say. The third moment. Oh, the third moment. It's so beautiful, the third moment. Isn't it? <sighs> ah, that was consoling. But consolation is not all. We need to do the work that we have to do. We need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough. You hear it? That's it. That's the answer. The truth we've been seeking. And I know that if we sing it with the faithful courage of our hearts and minds, then God will listen. Thank you. It's so much fun. <laughs> I hear those words. The cellos and basses are so eloquent. They're singing to us. They're encouraging us. They have to go through everything we've been through before, but it's not enough. Do you see what Beethoven's saying to us? He's saying to us that if we want to celebrate, if we want to make our way to joy, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> That's a very Jewish concept, too. <laughs> I need a little break here. So my sister got me this. Let's see if it works. OK. Put on the tie here. Let's see if it works. Uh, ah, here it is. OK, ready? Good, okay, that's it. Right. It's in the wrong key. It's in the wrong key, sorry. Let's put it, let's listen now the right key. As in any good opera recitative, you do all the work of speaking and speaking, but what's opera really about? It's about the aria that comes next. And as long as the cellos and basses did all the work, all the schlep of getting through that recitative, and tearing their hair out and doing the inventory of the first three movements, I think they've earned the right to sing the song themselves. Let's see if we can get the sound here. They get to sing it all by themselves. But listen, this has been turned into a hymn, a Protestant hymn, right? Joyful, joyful. But it gets really square in church. <laughs> they lose the syncopation. Listen to how he syncopates it. You hear it? He syncopates. Just like rock and roll. Uh-oh. And then the... And then the violas take over. And little by little, that beautiful song of the Ode to Joy makes its way up through the different instruments of the string orchestra. First, it was the cellos and the basses. Now it's the violas. And the bassoons and the cellos are playing a beautiful line against the tune in variation with it. Don't forget the syncopation. La, 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 la,
One, two, three, four. One, two. I feel sorry for Protestants. <laughs> Just because they don't syncopate. I'm also very jealous of Protestants because their music is so much better than mine. <laughs> I mean synagogue music. Because we're not allowed to use instruments in the conservative shul. It's horrible. One reason why I'm not in synagogue today. I'm with you. Violins are singing. Violins are singing. Everybody's going to sing. After the repeat of this strain, don't forget the syncopation. Don't forget to syncopate. Sorry, we gotta move on, I only got 10 minutes left. Now listen, something's missing here, isn't it? We've got about five, six minutes of music in the finale so far. Uh-oh, there are 90 people behind the orchestra waiting to sing! <laughs> They've been waiting there, fortunately, I mean, in the old days, you had to, the, the chorus came on at the beginning of the symphony, Everyone has to go pee. It's like horrible. <laughs> They're like there for an hour before they have to sing. Fortunately, now there's a break before the third movement, after the scherzo, and that's when the chorus comes on. It's much more humane. <laughs> but they still have to sit a long time. And this also in itself is very dramatic because Beethoven is showing us he has to go through the motions of a symphony. A symphony is supposed to be just instruments, right? So we got a whole first wave Trying it out. Is it going to work with just the orchestra? We get the cellos and basses going through this ordeal of the inventory of the first three movements. And then they get to sing the Ode to Joy. And the whole orchestra joins them in this beautiful set of variations on that tune. It's still not good enough. Music alone with instruments isn't going to cut it. Does that sound familiar? It's just the opposite in Hey Jude. Because in that song... Paul dramatized his sense that lyrics weren't good enough. They were nonsense. Everything was tumbling over each other. Remember how the bridge came in too early? Words won't cut it. The lyrics end. The song effectively is done. There are no more words because all we need is nah sense. <laughs> right? We surpass syntactical language and find just sound, noise, music itself. But that Beethoven tells us something seems to be different, which is music itself isn't good enough. We need words. We need words. And we need words very badly. We need words. And here's the rest of the team I was telling you about. Right? And what's he saying? He's saying, oh, Freud, I nicht dieser Töne. In German, it sounds really pissed off, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, my friends, let's not sing like this anymore. Not these tones. Nicht dieser Töne. In other words, we have another translation of, let's take a sad song and make it better. We now have the Beatles, Shakespeare, and Beethoven. Isn't that great? Now do you see why I did this lecture? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. It works. It works. Let's see what happens. It's, it's the second wave. It's the second wave. The voices have to do it. The voices have to do it now. Yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Rather, let's sing something better. Let's sing something better. 
und froh. Joy! Joy! Joy is very different from happiness, okay? Joy takes lots of work, especially for the sopranos in this symphony. They're singing so high. Freude! 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 There's the aria. Daughter of Elysium, the fire of God. These are Schiller's words, Friedrich Schiller. Beethoven tried to set this poem for 30 years. It took him three decades to figure it out. I think he got it right. This time. And now you understand the rep repeated nature of the tune. But you know what? So we have a question. We have a question. If Paul McCartney and the Beatles are saying words aren't good enough, words don't cut it, we need something more than lyrics, and that's the na 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 na. And then Beethoven's saying, oh, music isn't good enough, the orchestra's not good enough, the first three movements aren't good enough, we need a chorus, we need Friedrich Schiller, we need words. Who wins? Who wins? Words? Or music? What's the answer? Yes! <laughs> okay. The last thing I want to play for you, well, two more little things. Uh, there's a whole, I mean, can we meet again? <laughs> There's another half hour here. But look, just to hear it. This is so joyful. Look what's happening with the words of Schiller. They repeat little fragments of the poem, back and forth. What does that suggest to you? Beethoven is ripping apart the poem for his own musical purposes. He needs words. Why? So that he can destroy them. And everyone, the chorus is coming. What do they sing? What do they sing? I'll mention, I'll mention, I'll mention. I'll mention, I'll mention, I'll mention. If they mention, mention one more time, <laughs> I'm gonna scream. See, Beethoven shows us what's important to him. He doesn't give a dang for Schiller anymore. The actual structure and integrity of the poem itself collapses in the composer's hands. And he gives us the pure few syllables that mean the most to him. He takes words and turns them into almost nonsense. I'll mention, I'll mention, I'll mention, I'll mention. So that we hear over and again, all humanity will be brothers and sisters, all of us together, all of us, because we all need each other. Everyone's singing, because it takes not just a village, not just a nation, not just the world, but the entire cosmos to take a sad song and make it better. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> I didn't get a chance to go to shul this morning either, but I want to tell better. I feel better. I want to tell you I had a religious experience here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you have a question. I can tell you, Professor Rose knows everything about the Beatles. <laughs> And I know you have questions in every city they do. So if you raise your hand, I'll certainly bring it right here. When Paul 
hurt his throat. Yes. Every time they played Hey Jude afterward, what did he do? Oh, they were not performing in public anymore. The question was, so he didn't have to perform in public anymore. Actually, in 1967, or was it eight? You know this better than I actually. They actually missed playing in public after they stopped. So they went onto the roof of, of Abbey Road Studios and just started playing on the roof for the entire neighborhood, just once. But by that time, they were only working in the studio. So he was able to recover, <laughs> yes. No? OK. Oh, there's one. Why don't you say it loud? Maybe we'll hear it. Have you ever had a chance to meet any of Oh, almost. <laughs> The, f the former chancellor of Vanderbilt was close friends with George Harrison. And Chancellor Gee invited Mr. Harrison to come to Vanderbilt. One reason was so that he could visit my Beethoven Beatles class. But it was right at that same season that Harrison fell sick and he died that year. So I, I missed it by that much. But listen to this. A good friend of mine is very close friends herself with a person who lives next door to Sir Paul. <laughs> Unfortunately, next door is like five miles away because they live in these huge manor houses in England, right? So I'm not sure that's going to work, but we'll see. I hope to meet Paul still. Go ahead. Do you have any comments on the song Blackbird? Blackbird singing in the dead of night. What a lovely song. I, on, on that album, White Album, is the most glorious, eclectic album of all time. What the Beatles show in that album is that they can do anything. They can take any, any genre, any kind of song, country, western, I'm in Nashville, okay? And, or in this case, folk music. This is one of the most beautiful musics in the tradition of early Bob Dylan and the Weavers um, and uh, you know, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. It's a folk song. Simple and short. Yes, with a guitar. It's pure acoustic joy. And I think it's there, it's Paul's way of saying, I can do that too. And I can do it, it's not like, it's in this case, it's a loving thing. It's like he, he loves that sound so much, but he wants to show his own take on it. I think he did a pretty good job. Yeah. Quite the woman over yes. there in the corner. We just dig into everything, okay? We, we, every song becomes an occasion for profound inquiry, okay? And it's amazing because there are other connections too, especially, I, I started out with those beats in the violin concerto and she, I saw her standing there. You notice there wasn't enough discussion today about rhythm. I've mentioned the syncopation, which should be added to the Protestant hymn, okay? If you work in an Anglican church, please give them my suggestion. <laughs> okay? So there's a lot of work on rhythm, on beat. It gets quite technical, which is interesting because my, a lot of my students in that class have been non-majors. And they've been intimidated at first. Oh, Dr. Rose, Dr. Rose, I don't know anything about music. And I say, you are my favorite student because you have no preconceptions. We're gonna start from scratch. I don't expect you to know anything at the start of this class, but you will know everything <laughs> at the end of it. And it's not just because, I'm, what I mean by that, what do I mean by knowing everything? What does it mean to have a comprehensive knowledge? All it means is that you know that you haven't even begun to plumb the depths of a great work of art, and there's so much more you can know. And also, there are limits to that knowledge. You have to have humility and know that that kind of analytical inquiry only goes so far. And there's a mystery that cannot be touched. But that's part of the, what I'm talking about in the knowledge of a song. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Over here. Oh my gosh. I've been writing concertos for friends to play. Um, and it's interesting because the concerto, as you know, is mostly a genre having to do with a superstar, like, you know, like, like Itzhak Perlman playing in front of an orchestra. And it's really an occasion for a really glorious virtuoso player to show off. But if you really look at the history of concertos, that's not what it was about. It was always about the relation, the communion between an individual and a group of players. 
And that's what I've been investigating with some dear friends. And it's been both a musical pleasure and I would say a philosophical one, too. Do you have a favorite uh, Beatles solo album? Have you played this over the years? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the last one I listened to. <laughs> <laughs> Same with Beethoven symphonies. All nine of them are my favorite while I'm listening to them. The first is unbelievable. If you don't know the first and second, go to your iTunes or Spotify, Leonard Bernstein, New York Philharmonic. It's the best thing he ever did. I'm not kidding. And I love a lot of Lenny's stuff. But his recording with the New York Phil of Beethoven 1 and 2, it's the best one he ever did. But let me answer your question. I do think sort of uh, artistically, I think Revolver is the best album, OK? Just song for song and the way it's put together. It's just a knockout song after song. Rubber Soul, it comes a close second, OK? <laughs> Somebody said, what about Sgt. Pepper? Um, I, I love it, too. Like, I'm listening to Sgt. Pepper. Of course it's the best. OK, I hope that helped. <laughs> right, can I ask a question? Please, please. Sometimes we forget, Paul McCartney has continued to release albums yes. every few years. Yes. For a long time now. And at least in my opinion, and a lot of critics, they're not that good. Right. Uh, you have any thoughts on that, how he feels? That we're... Well, I think the same thing happened to John Lennon after the Beatles. I mean, his life was tragically cut short, of course. But in the stuff that he did, especially with Yoko, it's, there's, there's very few really great songs, like Instant Karma, no question about it. Or uh, Imagine, of course, is a knockout. But those are rare instances, and we need to think about this. This is the same thing having to do with the concertos I'm working on. These are, these are musicians who flourished as a band. And we can see with some poignancy that when they leave that, they are not at their best anymore. They need each other so much. The chemistry is essential. And it's like having sodium without the chloride. <laughs> There's no salt. <laughs> and you know, who's the acid and who's the base? It's been, I think John, yes, he's the acid, isn't he? And I think, you know, I think that there's a softness and a sweetness and a kind of a limey, that's a good word for a British person too, the limey quality to Paul that was so sweet that it was saccharin, Stephen. Saccharin. And he didn't, have, he didn't have John to say, yeah, mate, that's good, leave it in. Remember? <laughs> Leave it in. Don't touch it. Movement you need is on your shoulder. It's perfect. <laughs> they needed each other. That's what I call <coughs> art. I think you may collaborate with after the Beatles broke up. You made a difference, too. Yeah. George Harrison, I assume, was very successful. Yeah, but again, if you, it's like two or three songs. Two or three songs out of 40 or 50 and then you go back to the Beatles collection. It's like every song is just a golden thing. Every song is just gold. It's unbelievable, isn't it? It's like Beethoven. It's like, that's the other thing. Beethoven from Opus 1 to Opus 135. There's only one or two clinkers in there. <laughs> one or two rotten eggs. And every other thing is just glory. Quality is extreme. One more question here. Yes. What do you think of the current rock scene? <laughs> I need to go to the Hall of Fame tomorrow to find out, don't I? Um, I don't know if they keep up either. Um, my daughter is 20 years old, fortunately, so she keeps me informed. She sends me all of her latest favorites. But she tells me herself it's almost impossible for her to keep up because it's so fragmented. And there's so many different kinds of music, so many different audiences. And among that, you know, classical music is less than 1% of the market. So I'm a classical composer. What does that mean? What kind of audience can I hope for? But, so it's hard for me to keep up with the rock and roll audiences or market, because I'm pretty concerned about my own market and my own work. But I will tell you this. I think it has to do right now, in a very dramatic way, with women. <laughs> I think women are doing things musically and artistically in a way in the 21st century that was not even conceivable in the 20th or earlier, certainly. There are women songwriters, 
and, and composers and bands and artists and architects who are changing the face of music. And if I had to give, I actually was writing down my list of 10 most important people in the world. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying these are the best people, but they're the most important. I think Taylor Swift. <laughs> I mean, for young people, I mean, you may not like her music, but she's so enormously powerful for those young people as a role model. And she's a sweetheart, you know? But, you know, there are problems with that. Um, I, and then there's someone like Kanye West on his side. He's such a role model for young black, uh, young men, you know? And of course, it's so narcissistic, right? There's so much narcissism that it's really difficult to think about what it means for these to be important people. And, and they are important. But I think what the importance of such figures is that ultimately it will pass, right? <laughs> right? And that we will realize that such celebrity and fame is not the important thing. That what really matters is what endures beneath the surface. And that's what makes the Beatles so extraordinary. There was a Beatle mania. There was such a powerful popularity. It was impossible for anyone to understand that this music in 1963 was actually going to last. My parents didn't think so. <laughs> they hated it, right? What's that? Long the long hair or whatever, you know? It's just, so, anyway, I have the rest of my list if you're interested. <laughs> I didn't really answer your, oh, okay, well, I didn't finish it. I think George Lucas, uh, because I think the Star Wars myth is so, I mean, especially this year with the new one coming out, but every, every person of my generation and my children's generation has internalize the Star Wars mythology. It is part of their spiritual reckoning of life itself. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> um, okay, I think if, um, by the same token, J.K. Rowling or Rowling, I think Harry Potter has had an enormous, you see, of course, I'm a little biased. I'm looking at literature and music and art. I think there's an architect named Renzo Piano, and he's the, he just did the Whitney Museum in, in the, uh, the Meatpackers neighborhood in New York City. Piano is changing, literally ch changing the face of Manhattan. And that has become a center of such, not just artistic activity, but social activity. Young people are flocking to the Whitney Museum as they've never come to a modern art museum before. And that is so exciting. Am I being naive to think that an architect is one of the 10 most important persons in the world? I hope not. I think he really is. He's showing that a livable space is an artistic space. It's a place where you can actually experience art and other human beings without any discrepancy at all. In fact, that's what art has always been about. It makes us more human. It doesn't cut us off. That's why I've shared Hey Jude and the Ninth Symphony with you. That's what it's about. I think, Professor Rose, that's, we're gonna stop because it's four o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Un fuerte aplauso para el profesor Michael Rose de la Universidad de Vanderbilt. Qué increíble clase. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That was amazing, amazing class, amazing energy. You definitely transmitted to the to the whole auditorium here in Puebla. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're gonna we're gonna start with a few questions. We're gonna first say them in Spanish and then ask them to you and we're gonna be translating continuously. So we're gonna start with the first question. Vamos a empezar con la primera pregunta. Y es, ¿quién crees que logró mejor el objetivo de cambiar sentimientos? Beethoven y su coro al final o los Beatles con el ritmo y su música al final de Hey Jude. So, so the question is, who do you think best fulfilled the purpose of getting out the sorrow? Beethoven yeah. with his chorus at the end, or the Beatles with their energetic music and rhythm at the end of Hey Jude? <laughs> well, when my students ask a question like that, I have only one answer for them. Si. 
<laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, how can I choose? They're just so, both of them are so enormously joyful and both of them bring into play, into the same space, the entire universe of possibilities for human connection and, and for singing together and for understanding the chance that we have to be joyful together, which is so desperately necessary right now at this time when we can't even, we cannot even be together. So I, I don't want to um, avoid or evade your question. I don't want to, to be ungenerous. I want to answer your question, but it is for me, a matter of understanding that what Beethoven's doing in the Ninth Symphony depends so much on these large orchestral forces, this um, astounding, miraculous combination of orchestra and chorus and solo voices, this comprehensive account of classical music at its peak of power and on a completely different ground, in a completely different context, 150 years later, the Beatles do it in their way, at the peak of their powers, with all of the, resource that, the resources that they have, including the recording studio, and all of the technology that makes possible Hey Jude as a recording. And what they have in their limited you know mechanism of a band of, of the instruments of the piano and the guitar and the tambourine and but then to take the lid off of that to open it up yes to completely surprise us with the brass band at the end and, and all of the sounds including paul singing like a black man singing like Little Richard at the end. It's the surprise. It's the ongoing surprise of the Ninth Symphony finale and Hey Jude that makes it impossible for me to say anything else than yes, yes. Which one does it better? Yes. <laughs> wow. No, thank you for that amazing response. Digo, me está complicado traducir todo lo que dijo, pero básicamente la respuesta es sí, los dos son excelentes en lograr este cambio de sentimientos, en crear esta conectividad humana, crear esta alegría, este joyfulness como él menciona y más en estos tiempos que pues se requiere, ¿no? estamos hablando de tiempos difíciles como el COVID, pero Beethoven lo hace de una forma impresionante con con esta música clásica con, en el peak, ¿no? en la cima de, de lo que es la música clásica. Y los Beatles también con su final, en el que, en el que entra la voz inesperada de Paul, que, que hay unos cambios de sentimiento también brutales que te sorprenden. Entonces, la respuesta es sí. La respuesta es sí, los dos son increíbles. And thank you very much. <laughs> Vamos con la segunda pregunta para nuestro magnífico profesor. Dice así, ¿qué impacto tuvo Beethoven en la música y las futuras generaciones de artistas? Michael, the next question is as follows. What impact did Beethoven have on music and the future generation of artists? Wow, that's a good question because it's so difficult. Um, I think the true quality of any artist is just how many different ways he or she or they can be interpreted. I would go even further and say the true quality of any artist is just how many different ways he or she or they can be misinterpreted. <laughs> I love the idea that everyone that comes after Beethoven 
willfully, deliberately misunderstands Beethoven. Wagner totally messed up Beethoven. <laughs> he just didn't get it. But because he loved Beethoven, he did something the world had never heard before. And Brahms, Johannes Brahms, interprets Beethoven completely different. And you know who else? <sighs> Bela Bartok, one of the great composers of the 20th century. And then someone like Chuck Berry, who says to Beethoven, roll over, Beethoven. You see what I mean? That the influence of Beethoven is so profound, so all-encompassing, that everyone who touches Beethoven and is touched by Beethoven completely understands and misunderstands Beethoven differently, including me. There's not a note of music that I've composed in my entire life as a composer that has not been actively, mindfully, subconsciously also informed by my love of Beethoven. I can't blame Beethoven for that. That is to say, what I do with Beethoven is my fault, but I could not have done it without him. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, that's an amazing answer. Bueno, nos explica que claramente el compositor Ludwig van Beethoven era una persona sumamente intricada y por ende su influencia en cada compositor después de él y en cada persona que escucha en su música es interpretada y misinterpretada en diferentes formas. Claro que tiene una vasta, muy vasta influencia en todos los artistas y yo creo que es algo muy personal, sumamente personal, de cómo interpretan y cómo transmiten la música de Beethoven en su propia. Gracias. Pregunta 3. ¿Cuáles son las similitudes más evidentes entre las composiciones de Beethoven y las canciones de los Beatles? So, question 3. What are the most evident similarities between Beethoven's compositions and the Beatles songs? Yes, um, I don't know what the word is in your language for nerd, N-E-R-D. Is there a word for it? Nerd. Nerd, someone who just loves the technical details, right? The technical details of anything, in this case of music, of how a piece of music is put together. But for me, The, from the very beginning, when I started teaching this class at my uni university, at Vanderbilt University, I knew that the way of bringing my students into the classroom, and this was marketing, right? This was my salesmanship. I could bring the students into the classroom by seducing them with, with the Beatles. Because they were, you know, everyone knows the Beatles. The reason why I wanted to bring the Beatles into the classroom was exactly the reason why I teach Beethoven, which is that the Beatles are really, really a bunch of nerds. <laughs> They love the details. They love putting things together in their songs with infinite care, with so much attention to detail with so many interconnections, ways of understanding how this event leads to this event and how this chord is answered by a chord later on and how a particular rhythm evolves and grows and changes according to the words, according to the lyrics, according to the story that's being told in the song. And Everything that happens is important. There's not one thing that happens that shouldn't be there. And if you lose one note of it, the entire structure collapses. And that's true of Beethoven too. And that regard for putting something together with that kind of loving care is what art is all about. And that's what connects these two amazing phenomena And it's why I had to teach that class. Thank you. Pues los dos son obsesivamente nerds, o sea, los Beatles y, y Beethoven. O sea, son 
súper estructurados, súper atentos a los detalles. Si algo está ahí es porque debe estar ahí, nada sobra. Y eso es lo que le atrajo al profesor Michael crear esta clase, ¿no? O sea, revisar la obsesión y la composición de ambas canciones fue lo que ayudó a que trajeran, traer alumnos a su clase porque los Beatles son muy atractivos, pero también le interesa mucho aprender de, de cómo piensan estos dos artistas de forma tan precisa. Entonces, thank you for the answer. Thank you. Cuarta y última pregunta para Michael. ¿Cree usted que las composiciones de Beethoven tuvieron una influencia directa sobre los Beatles o fueron las similitudes en su trabajo una coincidencia? Michael, do you think Beethoven's compositions had direct influence over the Beatles or were the similarities in their work more of a coincidence? Oh, another good and difficult question. Um, I think in this case, we have to give a lot of credit to a man named George Martin. George Martin was the, the person who helped the Beatles turn their compositions into really gorgeous compositions. That is to say, he made them classical. In fact, George Martin was the producer of the early albums of the Beatles. And what's a wonderful coincidence is that George Martin was in charge of producing classical recordings for the British Broadcasting Corporation. He was a classical musician and he inspired the Beatles to do classical things. For instance, to put a Baroque trumpet in the song Penny Lane or to do a Baroque piano solo in In My Life, or to add a harpsichord, a harpsichord to um, Cry For No One. And so, the, at least on the surface of the Beatles songs, there's a lot of classical stuff going on, but f there's something deeper, I think. There's something deeper that connects them in a classical way. And that, that's just because they're great artists. And I think that all great artists are connected without any coincidence at all. Or in fact, it is the supreme coincidence. It's what, what does coincidence mean? Literally, what does coincidence mean? It's that things happen together. And when Shakespeare writes a sonnet about a sad boy, and when Paul McCartney writes a song about a sad boy, And when Schiller writes a poem about sad people, and when the Beatles write a song with Shakespeare and Beethoven about how to turn that sadness into joy, it's exactly what the psalmist was singing about in the Psalms of the Bible. That joy will come in the morning after a night of sadness. This is an idea that is eternal and all art and all literature and all music belongs to that idea. That's the coincidence. Amazing, amazing. Thank you. Bueno, nos explica Michael que George Martin, que era el, el productor de los Beatles en sus etapas más, este, más al comienzo, era un productor de música clásica. Entonces, claro que eso influyó muchísimo en su obra, en la obra de los Beatles, y que realmente las coincidencias en el arte no existen, o tal vez todo es una enorme coincidencia. Nos explica que las coincidencias claramente pasan entre artistas y entre, no solo en música, sino en todos los artistas de artes y artes plásticas, en todo el mundo del arte, y realmente es el conocimiento de este señor es algo impresionante. Por favor, denle un muy grande aplauso. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. El profesor Michael Alec Rose de la Universidad de Vanderbilt. Thank you. Pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I hope we meet soon. Take care. Thank you.
Bueno, espero que hayan disfrutado estas magistrales clases. De verdad, yo las disfruté muchísimo. Muchas gracias a nuestro aliado One Day University y al maestro Tomás Barreiro por este increíble segmento. Este, y vámonos a comer dos horas, por favor. Los invitamos a los food trucks que están en la explanada y nos vemos a las 5.40. Gracias.